Welcome back to Computer Science E1. My name is David Malin. This is Lecture 2, and this is a sneak preview of what we will be doing next week. So as I mentioned last week, we will use this film as our proxy of sorts for exploring one of the topics on the course's syllabus, namely that of software, of which operating systems are certainly a great part. So that film will be right here, same time, same place, and it will be accompanied by some popcorn and some soda. Um, and you are more than welcome, those of you local, to bring family, friends, dates. Um, and for those of you who are tuning in from afar, distance education for reasons of copyright, we can't shoot the entire film, um, sort of uh, bootleg style, but you are encouraged, though not required, to try to rent or borrow this from a local library or uh, video shop. So with that said, a couple of administrative matters, some things that have come up since we last met. There is a great deal more information now available on the course's website, largely because we have now had one of the course's lecture. Uh, lectures, what I wanted to draw your attention to, and so far as that it is representative of what you'll have access to in the weeks to come, are the resources that are, have since been posted for last week's lecture one. So notice that in addition to all of the handouts that were made accessible on printouts uh, last week, those are also posted in PDF format online. As an aside, if the idea of using the web, incidentally, or PDF has just gone over your head, that's fine. Simply speak with me or a member of the staff, and we'll bring you up to speed as to all of these things I'm saying. But for now, we'll assume that almost all of you are familiar with web usage. But in addition to these PDFs, you'll notice a few additional resources. As promised, the teaching fellows have kindly taken uh, scribe notes of sorts. So for those of you who were hopefully get engaged mentally and audibly and conversationally in last week's lecture know that you do have as a resource a wonderful outline of last week's lecture. Dan Armandar has happened to do this particular set of notes. In addition, thanks to a woman who has been kind enough to offer her expertise on our behalf, uh, Karen, Ray's wife, you can not only now watch the movie version of Computer Science E1, you can also read the 30-page book version. So this is a transcript that Karen put together of us, uh, for us of every word that apparently came out of my mouth last week. Um, and I only can guess how many words a minute I apparently talk. So there you have a full 
raw, not necessarily eloquent transcript of what transpired. In fact, if you read it aloud, I kind of sound like a doofus, but it in, does in fact have all of the requisite information. But you might find the notes a useful outline of precisely that same content. Finally, the video of lecture one is available. This too will be representative of what we'll do this semester. Um, in addition to the real video versions, which some of you who have taken distance courses already might be familiar with, there's two other formats. Know that the real video format right now is publicly accessible, but if you pull it up, you'll notice that you can choose from a number of different formats and essentially you will get, if you choose the highest quality version of this, a video that roughly fills your screen as it is now. And then after a few moments, we'll begin streaming what you already saw last week. And in addition, that's usually synchronized with slides that I was using on the overhead. So everything's nicely synchronized. In addition to that, you will find that the videos are currently available in two other formats. Um, which one is best, we will defer to you. But as promised, the course is available via podcast, which means you can access the course via iTunes or more directly via a link such as this. So if you're familiar with the QuickTime file format, you can access a downloadable version of the course that you can save to your laptop, hard drive, and, or whatnot. And you can also view a flash-based version of it, which we'll also come back to in a moment. And this version essentially is smaller, but plays immediately within the confines of your browser window. So you have so, in short, you have no excuse for ever missing a lecture in this class. And so you could literally have it read aloud to you uh, this semester. Um, but just know that these resources are available to you. And know, too, if you were just rather overwhelmed by all of these different technologies, we have a workshop coming up this Saturday, which addresses precisely those issues. So Ray will say something about that in just a moment. Notice too, though, that on the videos of the week link for the course's website, thanks to the course's staff, we have a wonderful first set of videos. As promised, roughly each week during the semester, we'll release a thematic set of four or so videos of the week, five to 15 minute bite-sized segments, if you will, on some very specific topic. Uh, so what you have, for instance, here, if I choose one of the four, and if, again, you choose the Flash version, and Flash is particularly well suited for relatively short videos where you don't mind watching it within your browser window, you will see, actually, you'll see a goofy guy come up here in a moment. We don't need more of him. Let's fast forward to the good stuff. So you'll see here Ray offering a 10 or so minute um, expose of upgrading a PC. And the other videos that are now available include adding RAM to your computer, changing your BIOS settings, and finally um, dissecting a PC. So you'll see similar sets of videos like that released in the future as well. And if that weren't already enough, mind you, this is just ways to access last week's material. What you'll notice is that via the podcast link on the course's website, this simply provides you with another means of accessing the same content, but just so that you've seen it before, if you decide to tinker on your own, what you'll see if you click the appropriately named link on the course's website's podcast page is that you'll see if you have iTunes on your computer, it will actually pull up the course via Apple's iTunes interface, et cetera. So no excuses really for missing any content in this course. And there will be additional content in the form of sections and some workshops and so forth. So it's all there. Um, with that said, are there any questions? Now that we've so lowered the bar to accessing the course's information. No? All right. Um, we got that down. Notes, transcripts. OK, one other thing. And it's been great. I spent um, this past weekend answering 10 or so not dumb questions that arrived digitally. So you'll notice on the left-hand side of the website, in addition to having this link to the not dumb questions website, we are also now currently listing the most recent 10 questions that have been asked. And if you just click on one of those links, you'll see what answer has been posted in response to that. Uh, finally, problem set one has been released tonight. So you should see a handout, among others, tonight that has lots of zeros and ones on it. That is the course's first problem set. It is due a couple weeks from now, on October 11th. And as per the directions atop that problem set, you can either submit it on paper on the right before class begins that Wednesday, or what we would encourage and will ultimately expect as we progress in the course, that you'll submit it electronically, essentially by typing up your answers in Microsoft Word or some similar format, and then just shy of the deadline, you would be expected to go to 
and the course website's Dropbox's page, accessible via the alphabetical links at left. And if you follow the on-screen directions, you'll simply upload your file to the website where the teaching fellows will then have access to it. Um, sections and workshops. Final two announcements before the new juicy stuff. Um, tonight begins the first of the classes sections. These are small, um, smaller, more intimate classes led by the course's teaching fellows, usually more hands-on, more practical, whereas lectures are obviously more conceptual and more verbal. Um, they begin tonight, as Ray announced over email. If you didn't see it, if you chose Wednesday section as your first preference last week, Guess what? You won Wednesday section. Everyone got their top choice, and if you chose Saturday as your top choice, you have been assigned to the Saturday section. You'll probably find that Wednesday is a bit larger than Saturdays if you ultimately want to tweak or find yourself wanting more attention, but they do begin tonight. So come 7.35 p.m., if you would like to follow one or more of the teaching fellows to the computer lab downstairs, tonight is the night, if you're in the Wednesday section, where you will take a PC, like the one I had up here last week, and not we, but you, We'll actually get your hands dirty pulling things out and hopefully putting them back in eventually, but also walking through things on a verbal tour of sorts with all of the teaching fellows by your side. Saturday will repeat that same process, and in fact, Saturday we have one other option, which is the optional workshop. The first one is entitled Using a PC and the course's website. This too is optional, but this one in particular is really catered to the, uh, the neophytes in the class, those of you with a little hesitation as to all the magic I was just discussing up here, or if you're a little uneasy with using it. In fact, let me allow Ray to give a quick pitch as to what you'll do that in this one. So even if you feel like you're comfortable using a PC and going through the course's website, uh, I do recommend coming anyway because we'll lay down a framework and a vocabulary upon which we'll build for the rest of the semester. All right, excellent. That's it for announcements. So any questions from you? The Saturday section will, will be head where? Uh, the Saturday section will be in this building in the basement, Science Center B09. It's the PC computer lab there, as will the Wednesday section. And all, I'm sorry? Uh, the workshop on Saturday is at 3 p.m. At 3 p.m. And for your reference, all this information is always posted on the website if you ever miss an announcement. Anything else? All right, so here's a doozy of a question. What did we do last week? What did you learn last week? I'll take anything. All right, binary code. All right, sorry, binary's already been said. Binary code we learned. So binary is the language that computers speak, made up of zeros and ones, fundamental building blocks for everything we did then. All right, what else did we do last week? Okay, so we took apart the inside of a CPU. I'll be a little more precise. We took apart the inside of a computer, because recall that the CPU was just that piece of ceramic with metal prongs, and that we did not physically expose, but typically people will refer to a computer in desktop form as the CPU, even though, as you saw last week, that's only a smaller component of it, but sure, we did that. What else? Okay, good. So we talked about hard drives and storage. And recall, we began the night by discussing how magnetic storage specifically works. So let's lead up from where we left off last time, which was with this discussion specifically. We said that there is in a typical computer sort of a pathway between a computer's CPU, which we just mentioned, and the CPU in layman's terms is the brain and the processor, the, the brains of the computer, the thing that does all the thinking and the math. And we have the hard drive, which in layman's term does what for you? And storage, right? It's where you store your documents and your programs in such a way that if you pull the plug or shut down, everything still stays there. But we said in between these two things last week, and this was one of the notes we concluded on, you have this other type of memory. And this other type of memory is RAM. So why this duality of memories? What does RAM do, or what's it used for in contrast with a hard drive? RAM is temporary memory, so it's Good. that you save like, something that you're working on, versus the hard drive has certain rebuilding functions that allow you and your computer on for it to start up. Okay, good. So whereas RAM is used for temporal storage, data is only saved there temporarily, and essentially only when you're working on it, a hard drive, by contrast, is for 
long-term storage. And I would redact your comment about read-only, but I would say that the data that's stored on the hard drive is permanent. And by permanent, we mean when you turn the power off. You can certainly delete data, but it's not based on the computer being on. Yeah? Can you turn off the computer as the RAM wiped clean every time? Good question. When you turn off your computer, is the RAM wiped clean? For all intents and purposes, yes. As soon as there is no longer a flow of electricity through the computer to maintain the zeros and ones that were tucked away in the RAM, yes, you lose them when the electricity goes off. So just to put this into context then, when you double click a program on your computer, like Microsoft Word, in effect what is happening, this is cutting some of you off, you are double clicking Microsoft Word.exe on your hard drive. In effect, the computer is then loading all of the zeros and ones that comprise that program, that is the zeros and ones that Microsoft put together in such a way that the end result is a nice uh, word processing program, they're temporarily loaded into RAM. And then effectively, one by one, or in groups at a time, they're loaded or passed into the CPU, which actually makes that program run. In effect, it takes the zeros and ones and does something with them so that you have the effect of an interactive word processing program. When you click Save, meanwhile, what happens is any of the data, well, rather, let's take a step back. If you, with Microsoft Word, then open your resume. Well, that permanently is stored on your hard drive, but if you're going to start working on it, it's in effect loaded into RAM, which is, again, temporal storage. And the moment you hit Control-S or go to the File menu and choose Save, that's when those zeros and ones that comprise your resume are copied back to the hard drive permanently. So ergo, consider the all too common or at least familiar situation in which for whatever reason you haven't been saving a document during the hour or so that you've been working on it. Well, what happens if some, you lose power or all of a sudden the computer crashes or someone kicks out the cord? Which, of you, which among you have had this horrific experience where you fail to save your data and for whatever reason, I mean, me too, multiple times. And that's typically because you've either lost power or the computer has crashed while your important bits, the document you're working on, the spreadsheet you're working on, the email you're composing, whatever it is, they're still stored in RAM because that's where bits lie when you're actually using them and interacting with them. And if you fail to hit Control S, they never actually get tucked back away onto the hard drive. Now this, the number of hands that go up each year is steadily decreasing because pro companies like Microsoft are building in sort of dummy proof features to things like Microsoft Word whereby even though you might not proactively be saving your document every few minutes, a lot of programs these days are doing it for you. So that if you actually, how many of you for instance have had the experience of Losing power, computer crashes, you know you haven't saved your document, and yet the next time you boot up your computer and load Microsoft Word, it actually gives you a little window and says, hey, do you want to recover this file or that file? Well, what is it doing? Without your knowledge, it's just writing those bits out to disk without you asking it to. And the quantities, let's throw some numbers out here just because they're so commonly seen in print and ver heard verbally. How big is a typical hard drive again? 60 what? Yeah, so 60 gigabytes, and I'll go somewhat lower as a lower bound for maybe a laptop. 20 gigabytes to maybe, I just the other day, as I think I said last week, bought a 400 gigabyte drive. A little trivia, how many cents per gigabyte did I propose you never pay more than? 35. Yeah, roughly 35 cents a gigabyte. You need not spend more than that for a hard drive such as the ones that look like this that we've been passing around. Um, simply because that's the price point these days. In fact, you can do as well as 24 cents a gigabyte. Now that might seem sort of like quibbling over nothing, 10 cents. Well, multiply this by, you know, multiple gigabytes and you're talking, you know, $10 savings, $100 savings, depending on how big the drive is. Contrast this <coughs> with RAM. How much RAM does a typical computer have? 512. Megabytes, so 512 megabytes, and I'll go a little lower for a typical bound these days, 256 megabytes to maybe 1,024 megabytes, a.k.a. what's 1,000 megabytes? One gigabyte. And it's just the same thing as one gigabyte. And for instance, my computer, and I'll use my computer as sort of the extreme sometimes, not that I'm 
bragging since it's a silly sort of thing, but you can get computers with two gigabytes. Servers will tend to have three, four, maybe more gigabytes of memory these days. If your computer, by contrast, is still in the age of 64 megabytes, 128 megabytes, the requirements of today's software are steadily outstripping your computer's capabilities, simply because they're demanding more RAM than that. Let's put one other number on the board. If these are measured in size, how do you measure the performance or quality of a CPU typically? Yeah, and the speed of it is in megahertz, or more commonly these days, gigahertz. Right? So clearly there's a pattern here. Almost all the answers end in mega or giga so far tonight. So what's a common speed for a CPU? Uh, wrong context. 54 400 RPMs refers to hard drives, not CPUs. So it isn't megahertz, gigahertz. Just give me a number. I, I'll take 700 megahertz up to who has the fastest computer in the room. That's not me. Three, sorry? Three gigahertz. Three gigahertz computers. Good. So it might go up to three gigahertz. And those numbers, too, go up and up every year. Well, what does it mean to operate at three gigahertz? Well, sort of in layman's terms, that means the computer is capable of doing three billion things per second. A hertz means per second. So that's a lot of things per second. But one of the issues we'll explore tonight is that particularly when you're buying a computer or thinking about a computer, it doesn't necessarily suffice to just go and get a new CPU that's several hundred megahertz faster if the bottleneck in your computer is perhaps in one of these other devices. So when one talks about or considers upgrading his or her computer or buying a new computer, even though a lot of advertising sort of simplifies things these days and largely talks about computer speed in terms of the CPU speed, there's actually a lot of other numbers, none of them confusing, that actually are just as, if not more, relevant as well. So we'll try to explore a couple of those tonight in the context, for instance, of maybe uh, Dell.com or Apple.com, just to put it into real world perspective. Well, this is a curious thing. 20 to 400 gigabytes and yet no more than eh, two gigabytes. If RAM is what you really need, because that's where your data is stored while you're using it, why do we see this disparity in terms of the size of your hard drive versus RAM? Like, why don't computers have 400 gigabytes of RAM? Okay, good. So you don't need to, as a matter of course, need to save all of the data that is, in effect, permanent in RAM because, one, you don't need to use it all at once. And if that's the case, why bother wasting time copying it all over there? There's another issue as to why RAM tends to be smaller in quantity than hard disk space. Cost. Cost is one of the most simplest but most obvious answers to these kinds of questions. In computers, why do you sometimes have less of something than the other? Probably because it costs more or because you don't need it, because you simply don't need it for performance reasons. So RAM tends to be faster than a hard drive because, again, like I said last week, there's no moving parts. And that usually in the world of computers is a good thing. One, nothing can really break, at least physically. And two, anytime you have mechanical motion besides failure, that just takes time. Mechanical devices are slower, so whereas these things have the the platters that we discussed and are read sort of like a phonograph, RAM, purely electrical. Faster, more expensive, slower, but cheaper. And in fact, let's introduce one other type of memory into the foray, because we'll see it in common advertisements today. It turns out that in this sort of pipeline that exists between your hard drive and your CPU, there's two other types of memory. And I'll draw them as one, Two, and the pathway is, continues in this spirit. What types of memory are these? Do you know? Good, cache. So these are sort of the finer print that are, in fact, in a lot of advertisements, and they're sometimes pitched as being a good thing for the consumer, but often the consumer doesn't really have control over what quantities of these types of memory you get. It's more a function of what CPU, for instance, you're buying. But yeah, they're called L1 cache for level one, an L2 cache for level two. We don't have to even go into detail here, but I've tried to draw them somewhat to scale in that hard drive is big and slow. This is faster but more expensive. 
This is even faster and more expensive. And you tend to have maybe, let's say, uh, 512 kilobytes to maybe, uh, let's say, 2 megabytes. So you can even have more than that these days of L2 cache. And then L1 cache, even faster, but relatively more expensive. And you have maybe 32 kilobytes to maybe 1024 kilobytes. But these, again, are just typical values, not necessarily absolute bounds, small or big. Yeah? It's a good question. What, in what physical form do they come? Usually in a form that you can't see. At least L1 cache is built into the CPU usually in a way that you can't physically see it. L2 cache often is built into the CPU in some way, though in some computers L2 cache will actually be on a separate card, similar to the RAM DIMMs that we passed around last week. But you as the consumer wouldn't buy these separately. Uh, typically, they would again come as sort of a package with your CPU. Okay, so why this complexity or why this pipeline? Well, for now, just suffice it to say that because you have this pathway where you have a lot of storage out here, but relatively slow, all sort of leading down this pathway to faster, albeit more expensive memory, computers essentially today can make use of this fact that the closer you get to the CPU, the faster the memory gets, so that essentially the job of L1 cache is to make sure that there's always some bits that are just waiting for the CPU, just waiting to get fed into the CPU, and then being, um, being there for the CPU to return values to, if necessary. It's just like keeping someone really fast, sort of uh, the old analogy of um, or a scenario of people trying to put out a fire by passing buckets along. Think of it as, as you get down the line, the buckets move even faster and faster so that there is always a guy right next to the fire, right next to the CPU, with water, with something for the next guy to actually make use of. And that's all. And we'll come back to this later tonight in the context of some real-world advertisements. Yeah? Ah, a good question. Um, does this scenario allow us to put into context the situation when you click on something and the thing is just spinning? Your, your <coughs> excuse me, cursor is spinning, your computer is waiting. Yeah, let's see if we can actually do that because very much related to the situation, let me take this, tac appro this approach first, is something called memory but called virtual memory. How many of you have virtual memory in your computers? So only one of you or two of you know it. But if you have any sort of modern computer made in recent years, you all have virtual memory in your computers. We as humans like to be able these days to run multiple programs at once. Right? We don't want to have to quit Microsoft Word just so that we can load Internet Explorer or some other program. So you as the user often have two, three, a dozen different programs running in Windows in your system tray or taskbar and so forth. But again, computers, as we touched on last week, can only do one thing at once. They just give you the illusion of doing multiple things at work, uh, multiple things at once, printing, spell checking, just because when you're talking three gigahertz, if that thing's doing three billion things at once, it can certainly trick you into thinking it's doing everything at the same time. Well, computers can use this fact to their advantage because suppose you have Microsoft Word running but you haven't been using it for 10 minutes, for 20 minutes. You haven't bothered to quit it because, eh, who cares? It's just back there in the background minimized. Well, what a computer will do is recognize that fact and exploit the relative um, dormancy of certain programs. In what context? Well, if you only have a finite amount of RAM, let's say 256 megabytes of RAM, isn't a huge amount these days, technically you can only fit 256 megabytes worth of information into your RAM. Well, what if you are crazy about clicking on your programs, loading lots of things at once, opening really big files, maybe some of the videos from the course's website? What is this? I think I hit play instead of record. All right. <laughs> well, this is, that's, uh, you got quite the leader here, huh? All right. <laughs> so. Messed up again, right? <clears throat> so, 
If you only have a finite amount of memory here, 256 megabytes, at some point, you're going to try to open one too many programs. And back in the day, the computer would just at that point say, eh, out of memory, cannot load this program. Or you'd get some weird error message because the computer didn't handle that situation well. Well, contrast that with today. You're rarely, if ever, told, whoa, you're trying to do too many things at once. I won't let you. Rather, the computer tolerates your enthusiasm, but instead, what do you experience as a result when you try to do too many things at once? Slow down. Things slow down. And for instance, you might get a spinning icon more often than you might like. Well, one of the things that might be happening, certainly one of the things that we can discuss in this context, is that the computer at some point needs to make room in RAM for whatever it is that you have in the front of everything else. Because clearly you want to be using the one program that's foregrounded, whereas you might not care as much about the stuff that's in the background. So what a computer, Windows, Mac OS, will typically do these days is if it realizes, oh, he's not really using that program right now, be unbeknownst to you, it will copy those zeros and ones that comprise that unused program back to the hard disk, not to their original location, but to some other area of the hard disk reserved by the operating system so as to free up some space here. And now your new program or your most popular program can actually make use of that information. But what did we say about hard drives vis-a-vis -vis RAM in terms of, say, performance? Which is faster? So RAM is faster, but if you have this really fast piece of hardware, constantly writing unused information here, but then, for instance, you hit Alt-Tab or you click the icon for that less used program, sometimes it takes forever for that thing to poke its way through your monitor. I mean, literally, you can't see something on the screen sometimes until finally things sort of piecemeal come to light in front of you. Well, what's happening is those bits are very relatively slowly being copied back into RAM, and meanwhile, someone else is being booted back to the hard drive in turn. And that is, dare say, one of the more common reasons that you would experience a slowdown, at least in the context of these different memories. And so if one discusses, for instance, upgrading his or her computer because it feels slow, often, but not always, that's a result of their needs or their expectations, frankly, just having risen over time, or equivalently, the expectations or needs of software that that person wants to use such that if you want to do more things at once, or with the very latest and greatest versions of software, you need more of this if you want them to fit into your computer at once. And I would say that of all the upgrades you can give to your computer, or all the upgrades that I personally might consider for a computer, RAM is one of the few that tends to be worth it financially, especially when desktops these days are only, even good ones, $250, $300, and it might cost you $100 to buy a new hard drive or $50 or $100 to buy more RAM. A lot of times it's just better to donate that computer to someone else or hand it down to someone maybe younger in your family, as seems to be the case in my family, though it starts here and goes to the rest of the family. Um, <clears throat> if you do that, or rather, that tends to be more economical, because you can get much bigger bang for your buck by just buying a new machine, but sometimes it's worthwhile to throw 50 bucks at the problem, even 20 bucks if you get a good deal with rebates these days, just to increase this. You will rarely, you should rarely be motivated in your computer to buy a new CPU or motherboard, because, if only because when you do that, you're effectively building a new computer anyway, since the more expensive parts tend to be here, and these parts these days tend to be relatively cheaper. But we'll explore some prices in just a bit. Okay, questions? Yeah? Uh, what about uh, advanced dual and quad uh, CPUs nowadays? Ah, wonderful question. Um, the former is more popular increasingly right now. You'll read in print of Intel's Core Duo, or the, uh, the Mac now has a line. It's our, the Mac already now uses Intel-based processors instead of the former PowerPC processors. All this means is that increasingly now the hardware inside your Mac and the hardware inside your PC are increasingly identical, at least in fundamental design. Well, the best CPUs, or even better, rather, CPUs today, even for consumer markets, are ones that are so-called dual core. You may know from years past that maybe higher end systems, companies would have uh, multi-processor computers. These are just computers with multiple CPUs. Well, the industry has essentially come up with a way to have one physical CPU 
but with two cores, as they're called, which for all intents and purposes mean that you can buy CPUs that are like two-in-one these days. Not all software, and including micro Windows and Mac OS, don't take very good advantage of this duality of CPUs these days. However, one of the gains you do certainly get from having a computer that has a dual core CPU is that you can do two, at least two, CPU intensive things at once. Well, what do I mean by that? Using Microsoft Word does not take much effort on behalf of your CPU. Sending instant messages, I mean, the CPU barely blinks. It can do one instant message and do a couple billion other things in that same second. If, however, you're a programmer doing what's called compiling, that is making software and sort of putting all those zeros and ones together, if you're a researcher and running uh, analysis programs with very large data sets, if you're a scientist or so forth. Therefore, in a normal computer, such intense computation would really bog down your computer. The beautiful thing about dual core machines is that operating systems today tend to at least be smart enough to put that really CPU intensive program on one of them effectively leaving you the other to send your instant messages and check your email. And I don't even make, mean to make light of that. The most recent computer that I built, whose specs we can take a look at, is dual core because it allows me to do research on one of the CPUs, background tasks that used to just bog my computer down to the point of unusability. Now I can essentially keep working on my machine while it churns away doing something very intense. Uh, it's a good question. So is, two, uh, is a CPU with two 700 megahertz cores, for instance, better than the same as or worse than one computer with a 1.4 gigahertz CPU? The short answer is that it depends. And it depends partly because of the reason I hinted at earlier, that the CPU isn't necessarily the sole bottleneck in your computer. And so it's hard to answer that question out of context. And the best way to answer that question would actually be to look at online reviews or reviews in magazines that actually run what are called benchmarks, because essentially representative tests with graphics programs, with games, word processing programs, and it'll give you a sense of the trade-offs. I will say that this gentleman over here mentioned that his CPU is 3 gigahertz, and there are, in fact, faster CPUs than that today. The dual core CPUs tend actually not to run as fast for a couple of reasons. Heat is one of them. Two, it's not as necessary when you can distribute the load properly. But those numbers, too, will get bumped up. But it's a hard question to answer out of context. One thing I will say, and we will similarly come back to this in a future problem set, if you're thinking about buying a CPU that's, for instance, one, uh, 2.2 gigahertz, or maybe you're offered the option for $200 more, you could get a 2.4 gigahertz uh, CPU. Rarely is an additional 100 or 200 megahertz these days worth the asking price. And this is how Dell, for instance, and other companies upsell you. They give you a very good computer for a very low price, but if you start tinkering with the numbers and tweaking things up just because you think, ooh, you know, 800 mega, well, 2.4 megahertz is bigger than 2.2 megahertz, therefore this is going to be a faster computer. And the fact of the matter is, for a typical computer user, you won't even notice the additional 200 megahertz, whereas you might notice the additional $200. Question, yeah? What if you had a duo RAM? What if you had duo RAM? Um, it's not quite... The logic doesn't apply quite as aptly, since you can simply throw more RAM at the problem. You could certainly devote one set of RAM to one core and the other set of RAM to the other. But the reason that dual cores is particularly helpful be is because, in essence, notice where everything in the computer leads to. And at the end of the day, that tends to be one of the bottlenecks. But it's not unreasonable, and you can come up with ways where that would be advantageous. Uh, yeah? Yes. Hyperthreading is a feature that was touted by Intel, and I think it may be AMD, perhaps with a different buzzword, which is that the um, <coughs> CPU gives the illusion of being multi-threaded, and that means gives the illusion of being more CPUs than just one. Uh, more real CPUs is better than hyper-threading. That was largely a marketing thing, and me, uh, 
not much software took good advantage of that. And these days, for the prices we're talking, you might as well just get the better hardware. But you can still find those these days. Yeah? So I hear the PS3 that's coming out pretty soon is has eight cores. And is that like eight cheaper cores rather than one that leaves tons of cores? So it's a good question. I don't know much about the uh, PlayStation 3, as this gentleman notes, which may have multiple cores, as many as eight. That can refer to different things. I'll defer perhaps to section or workshops where Ray or one of these guys who is more familiar with today's games than I am. But <clears throat> what that could refer to is, one, the CPU in the box. It could also refer in part to the graphics cards, since, as we briefly discussed last week, expansion cards expand the capabilities of your computer. Well, a computer will usually have a video card, and those themselves these days often have CPU use themselves so that all these crazy flashy and interactive video games that are so incredibly mathematically intense in order to generate the illusion of real-time video um, I suspect that if it does have multiple cores some of them are most of them are probably devoted to the graphics but I can't really speak to specifics or what the specs would be right now other questions so just two Wrap this up. Secondary storage, why is it called that? Secondary storage is everything in that direction. A hard drive is secondary storage. RAM, by contrast, is primary storage. You don't really hear people say primary storage, but you do hear people say secondary storage. So what also fits in this bucket of secondary storage is not just floppy drives or hard disks, or, um, but and also CDs and DVDs. And actually, let me touch on one topic here, only because we have a little screenshot here of this issue of defragmentation. How many of you have defragmented your hard drive recently? Wow. And you do this because you pull up the program yourself or you're prompted by the OS to yes or no? Do you want to defragment your hard drive? You do? Interesting. Okay. So defragmenting the hard drive essentially means the following. When you use your computer a lot over time, these computers these days on hard drives are smart enough to store your data in a non-contiguous manner. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, if we think of a hard drive or a floppy disk or other media, but really hard drives is where this is relevant, as just one platter, you know, one of these disks that you probably saw last week, there's a whole bunch of magnetic particles on top of that thing. Let's just think of them now as zeros and ones. Well, if you have a resume, that might take up this many zeros and ones. And it might be here, 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 and some pattern of zeros and ones. You know, a megabyte's worth, two megabytes, a few kilobytes worth. Well, you'll also clearly have other files on the disk. Maybe here is another file. Maybe here constitutes another file. Maybe here constitutes another file. And let's just say for argument's sake that this is a file as well. And currently then, let's suppose that the only free space on the hard disk is here and here. There are magnetic particles there, but they mean nothing right now. The computer's just not using them. Well, suppose that you try to save a document or you download a file that, in an attempt to draw this roughly to scale, is maybe that big which clearly doesn't fit there on the hard drive, clearly doesn't fit there, but for the sake of argument, let's say that if you chopped it up, this would fit there and this part would fit there. Well, computers today are smart enough to fragment files on your hard drive such that the bits that comprise some file won't necessarily be right next to each other on the hard disk. In fact, they do very intelligent things these days where you might have a file's bits spread out on the top platter, the middle platter, the bottom platter, and any other number of platters in between all over the disk. It all boils down to how quickly this reading head can get access to those zeros and ones. But in spirit, it boils down to this issue. But here's the thing. If the computer is sort of forced to put part of your file here and part of your file here, thinking again about a hard drive like a sort of very fast and expensive record player, what do you think the implications are for performance? You know, in theory, it should slow things down if it has to get bits from here, from here, from here, and then reassemble them in RAM as just one entity. So I've talked with a few people, um, computer science type people, about this issue, and the consensus among researchers that I know is that in modern computers, um, defragmenting your hard drive probably tends to have relatively little value these days, especially for particularly large hard disks and given the speed that some of today's drives operate. We've not bothered to verify this empirically, but I will say rather comfortably 
that the industry's approach or IT people's suggestion all too often to defragment your hard drive, the benefits of that are probably overstated. And just to put it into perspective, though maybe I'm the only one who's wrong, I've never once bothered defragmenting my hard drive in the past 10 years. And I suspect that even though you'll get pictures like this that suggest, wow, that's a lot of fragmentation. And this picture just means each color, think of it as representing a different file. So the more scattered things are, the more fragmented it is. These days, certainly as a human, manipulating the size files we're talking about, you probably wouldn't, you wouldn't even notice. But heck, if you want to prove us wrong and run some experiments, by all means, it's not a hard problem to actually analyze. But I wouldn't put so much attention, dare say, on the process of defragmenting your hard drive. Usually there are many other factors that would slow down your computer in a noticeable way that's not fundamental to what the OS is doing. More likely, it has to do with what you're doing, frankly, and what you're installing or what has been installed unbeknownst to you, for instance, spyware. And that's a topic we'll come back to in later weeks. Hmm, questions? Oh, you know, you let me get away with one thing. I said, hey, how many of you have virtual memory? And I said, you all do. And then I never told you what it was. So what was virtual memory, precisely? Well, virtual memory was simply the use of hard disk space as though it were RAM. So I forgot to actually slap a label on it when we were having this discussion, but anytime you're copying a program or a file from RAM back to your hard drive, your operating system is doing that for you, it's using what's effectively called virtual memory. And this is a process that is managed behind the scenes, or should be, left to the judgment of Windows and Mac OS. This is not really a parameter that you as a user need to even worry about. You can just take it on faith that it's doing it for you. Years ago, you would buy special software to do this for you, but no longer. Okay, any questions? Do you use power <coughs> Ah, good question. So if you lose power and some data has been tucked away in your hard drive in its virtual memory, do you lose the data? Most likely, yes, only because I suspect that the operating systems don't handle that scenario particularly well unless you put your computer into hibernate mode. I mean, in fact, have any of you put your laptops or desktops into the so-called hibernate mode? Yes? No? What does that mean then? What have you been doing? <sighs> You've been doing it, so clearly there's a reason. Why do you put a computer in hibernate mode? What? Saves electricity, sure, but so does turning it off. So why not shut down as opposed to hibernate? OK, so one is just convenience. When you put a computer into hibernate mode, and not all computers can do this, but if you go to your start menu, go to shut down, or even Mac OS might have this these days, you might have restart, shut down, and also hibernate, or even standby, which is different still. Hibernate typically takes the contents of your RAM, copies it all to your hard drive, and then puts your computer into a very low power state. The goal being you need relatively little power then to keep the computer in that state because all the important stuff is over here. And when the little progress bar starts moving across the screen, when you've woken the thing up from hibernation, it still takes a few seconds, maybe a minute, but that effectively is the process of those same former contents of RAM being, being put back in RAM. But while it's hibernating, the computer's not bothering to spend electricity maintaining the zeros and ones here. Standby mode, by contrast, take a guess what that does. Pretty much keeps, yeah, everything where it is in a lower power state. So, right, if the screen turns off, the drives turn off usually, but stuff pretty much stays in RAM. And so if you just put your laptop, it's useful for laptops. In standby mode, you can throw the lid up, hit a key, and pretty much be up and running much more quickly. But you're spending more electricity. And if I leave, for instance, my laptop unplugged in standby mode in my bag for a few hours, it'll often be dead by the time I pull it out because it is using electricity. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, safe mode, which is a largely Windows term, but there are equivalents in other operating system, essentially means that the computer has booted up without loading most everything you've installed on it. Specifically, it tends not to load what are called drivers. And you'll see this t implicitly in next week's videos. But long story short, for now, when you attach a new piece of hardware to your computer, you're usually prompted these days, right? It might say, oh, detected new hardware, your hardware is ready to use. But sometimes it says, oh, detected new hardware, 
what does it then tell you to do? You have to install what's called a driver. So for tonight's purposes, suffice it to say that a driver is just a piece of software that teaches your computer how to speak with some brand new piece of hardware. The reason that Windows and even macOS and other computers are plug and play, quote unquote, to some extent, is just because Microsoft and Apple have so preloaded them with companies' drivers in advance. But when Windows XP shipped several years ago, clearly all hardware that's been invented since then could not have had its drivers put onto your PC. And so if you're ever prompted, excuse me, to download software, quote unquote drivers, or put the CD in the drive that maybe came with your new web camera or digital camera or printer, that's simply because your computer doesn't yet know how to talk to that new device. And so the drivers allow it to speak that device's language. Safe mode then, We'll see if my voice retain, uh, persists for this lecture. Safe mode essentially is Windows or even Mac OS's attempt to say, whoa, something bad happened last time. Let me shut most everything off and let you get into your computer at least so if you have the savvy, you can try to figure out what the problem was and remove the software. The irony is, though, these days, if you're in safe mode, at least in Windows, last time I checked, you cannot load usually the add remove programs wizard. So you're sort of in this catch-22 where in order to remove whatever the offending software is that created the problem, you have to boot in safe mode. But safe mode to protect you doesn't allow you to add or remove software. And this might not be true with the latest version, but <coughs> safe mode is, is not ideal since most people, most typical users wouldn't know what to do when they got there except to restart and go back to normal mode, which often leads you to an endless loop of crashing. Other questions? Okay, how about a little video then? Let me rest my voice for a moment. So, you've all used probably a CD, whether it's in a car stereo, home stereo, or even your computer. But let's take a glance at what, in fact, is going on inside of a CD-ROM drive, which again is just another form of secondary storage. How can a CD-ROM disk hold so much more than a conventional disk? The CD drive reads data with a beam of light so narrow that the information can be squeezed together much tighter. You see, a laser diode creates this concentrated beam of light. The light travels through a prism. Then, through a lens and magnetic coil that focus the beam even more. On the other side of the compact disc itself are millions of tiny bumps called pits. <laughs> That's right, the bumps are called pits. The same surface has smooth areas called lands. These pits and lands are translated into the binary language of bits and bytes used by the computer. Okay, so we started that without much of a context, but all of you have probably used either music CDs or CD-ROMs. How much data do these things tend to hold these days? Yeah, so a typical CD-ROM disk that you might buy when you get Microsoft Word or you might get when you buy a new printer or digital camera, you know, a CD tends to have you know, maybe 650 to 700 uh, megabytes worth of data, or at least no more than that. If you buy a CD in the store to make your own CDs, these aren't called CD-ROMs, but they're rather called CD are. So you can even buy these in CDS these days. That's how sort of common this kind of technology has gotten. CD-ROM, R-O-M, we saw that last week actually. It means what? Uh, not random, read-only memory. So this is why if you buy a music CD or you buy Microsoft Office on CD, you can't delete data from that CD because it's read-only. And as that video started to hint at, a CD essentially has these things called pits and lands, sort of little holes or bumps that have been bored out of the, plast uh, of the uh, film, a layer of film or metal that's behind the plastic that effectively allows you to represent zeros, maybe with a pit, or ones with a LAN, or vice versa, or some similar encoding scheme. If you touch the bottom of a CD, you're not actually touching the zeros and ones themselves. On the bottom of a CD is simply plastic. And so in fact, you can actually damage some CDs more, at least CDRs, not by so much messing up this side, but sometimes even messing up this side, the label side, depending on how they're manufactured, for the following reason. Those things called CDRs that you might buy in CVS, are roughly the same size, usually, as a CD-ROM can be, but what does the dash R mean? Uh, it means it's writable, but uh, 
Right. So it, the R stands for recordable. So it's recordable in the sense that it's writable, but writable would be a W, and they wanted to go with R. So CDR is a recordable disc, but you can only write to it once. How do you write to a CD? Depends on the computer. Sometimes these days it's as easy as dragging files to the CD drive, maybe in my computer or the equivalent, and then choosing some write files menu option. Or <clears throat> you can use special software that might come with your computer, NeroVision, for instance, or software you might buy. But in short, they're recordable. Contrast these with the next progression, which were RW. Now it's more obvious. What's the RW? Rewritable. These things you can write to multiple times, a finite number of times, but they tend to be somewhat more expensive than dash R's. Some CD drives to this day can't read CDRWs as well as they can or at all versus CDRs. So these days, frankly, I would go so far as to say that most people, if they want to burn CDs, storage is so cheap, you know, a penny per disc, a couple pennies per disc, that who cares about being able to read write? If you need to read write, throw the old one in the trash and just write a new one. Frankly, that is what tends to happen, but it tends to be better for compatibility anyway. CDRs, you can store computer data on it, but you can also store as many of you have already. What else can you put on CDRs? Music. And so when you buy a CDR in CVS, it might say eh, roughly 650 megabytes, maybe 700 megabytes, or it'll say it in minutes, and a CDR holds how many minutes worth of data? Yeah, like usually uh, 74, 80 minutes worth of data, or of music, equivalently. Now contrast this with something very similar in appearance, but different in nature, namely DVD-ROMs. How much space does a DVD offer versus a CD? Good. So, you t a few too many of you, I feel sad that we have a yellow sheet circulating tonight again. So maybe 4.7 gigabytes. There are different types of DVDs this, these days, single layer, dual layer. Essentially, that refers to storing data essentially at one angle versus another. In fact, just random trivia, do any of you have a home theater DVD player such that when you watch a rented movie, usually about halfway during the movie, there's a slight jerkiness to it, where all the, it'll pause ever so briefly and then transition. You might not have even noticed this, but what that's usually the result of is DVD players changing the alignment of the laser to read one layer of the disc, and then it takes a split second to switch the lens so that it's reading another layer. And it's really annoying, and there's no reason technologically this could not be avoided, but I'm sure it's a reason of cost more than anything. In any case, there exist DVD R's, and this world is a disaster. There exist DVD plus R's, there exist DVD minus RW's, I think, and then plus RW's. It's a nightmare, honestly. And even I have never perfectly sorted out some of the differences. Essentially, they refer to different standards. Think of it somewhat in spirit to the whole Blu-ray fiasco and the different DVD competing formats for movies. My own sort of research into the matter has usually suggested that if you're going to burn a DVD, typically, and someone can debate me on this or show better evidence that I will happily adhere to, that these tend to be the most compatible. So if you want to burn DVDs for people to play either in their, stereo, in their home theater systems or in their computer, this tends to be the best standard to go with. But I say that with a bit of hesitation. Honestly, it's a disaster that there was not one specific um, standard agreed upon. That said, why don't we take a five minute break and then we'll resume. All right, I already hear some crinkling of wrappers, but it's at this point midway that we'd like to pass around some sugar of our own. So hopefully quite uh, appropriately, we bought a bunch of Smarties here. So if you'd like to pass these around, do help yourself. I hope, but can't promise they'll make their way all the way to the back. Um, I also meant to mention earlier in our discussion of problem set one, the following. As part of our experimentation with podcasting in the course and our affiliation with Apple in doing so, Apple was kind enough to offer us uh, this iPod t-shirt and also this iPod shuffle. So what we will be doing with problem set one, which again was just distributed tonight, um, this we will not be passing around quite yet tonight, but rather 
among all of you who submit problem set one, whether you're local or distant, for all, among all of you who submit problem set one and achieve a score of 75% or higher, you will automatically be entered into a raffle of sorts whereby the staff and I will randomly choose from that subset of people uh, two individuals randomly to walk home the lucky winners of the t-shirt and the iPod and will be announced a few days, a week or so after problem set one is submitted. So if you didn't already have incentive enough to do problem set one, um, by all means do so. If you're non-credit, you are certainly welcome to partake in this in, as well, but the bar would be set the same place for you. You would still have to submit problem set one. We'll grade it, albeit unofficially, but so long as you hit the 75% or higher, you'll be automatically entered into this contest. All right, so with that said, there's a bunch of technical detail on the slides entitled rewritable and recordable disks and so forth. And that's not meant to suggest memorization or so forth, but it's uh, slightly more technical detail on how pits and lands, for instance, are represented on a disk. But just to recap, you have two types of optical media, as it's referred to. Optical just meaning that it's read with light, that is lasers. The form factor of CDs and DVDs is exactly the same, but clearly there's a disparity in how much data these seemingly identical disks can actually store. Now, to the extent that the video you saw is accurate, and it is, in that data is stored as zeros and ones, as pits and lands, essentially pit, uh, holes and bumps etched into the CDs and DVDs, how is it that with the same size disk, you can store so much more information on a DVD, do you think? Okay, so you already you have this issue of multi-layer, whereby with some clever light tricks, you're able to store one level of data and access it via a certain angling of the light, and then you can get at a different set of data just by a different angling of the light. How that is is un, unimportant for now, but that's one way. Yeah. Okay, so you could use different wavelengths or frequencies of light. What translate that into more real terms? Okay, good. So let's focus on that. The notion of using a smaller, a narrower light, if you will. In effect, packing your bits closer together would be one approach, right? If you think of it on a macroscopic scale as a CD just being a bunch of bumps and a bunch of holes, we'll just use smaller bumps and smaller holes and pack those pits and lands, as they're called, even more closely together. That, too, might be another obvious way. And so the lesson here, too, is both of those are very valid reasons. Multiple layers, just packing things more closely, making things smaller. But uh, there's not a lot of magic to a lot of this stuff we'll discuss in this course. And if you simply apply, as we just briefly did, just a bit of common sense, put on the proverbial engineering hat, a lot of the basic questions here you can hopefully begin to sort of answer for yourself just by conjecture, knowing some of these basics. Let's take a slightly more detailed look at that same drive. Pairs of pits and lamps are laid out on continuous spirals. As the disc turns, a precise motor keeps the laser beam in place on the path. Where the laser beam hits the pit, the light is scattered. But where it hits the lamp, the beam is reflected straight back along its original path. The light enters the circuit again, but this time it is reflected at a 90 degree angle and strikes the device called a diode. The diode creates an electric pulse each time the light hits it. So when the laser hits the pit, no light bounces back. When it strikes the lamp, the diode sees the reflection and sends the pulse. These lights and pulses are sent to the computer, which interprets them as a pattern of zeros and ones. In other words, into binary code. So again, a bit more technical detail that we won't dwell on, but again, the idea here is a bit more exposure. And in fact, to the extent that we exposed you to um, this topic last week, let's quickly glance back at this thing. So this is an example of what? This big green thing. All right, so this is the motherboard, and the physiological analogy or metaphor that we offered last week is that the CPU is like the brains of the computer, and the motherboard is like the... Who was... The, sorry? Okay, we'll take nervous system. We said central artery system last week, but that sort of works too, although I'd say artery system's probably a little more apropos in that it's 
carrying data around and not sending messages, but sure. So there's a whole bunch of things on the motherboard. And those of you sticking around for section tonight or for section on Saturday or those of you tuning in remotely, you can take a look at Ray and Dan's online videos of the week for more explanation or exploration inside the computer. You got a bunch of things here. Fortunately, most of them are labeled, which will spoil any anticipation of my questions. But I can ask in the general sense what these slots here are. Yeah, so these are the expansion slots. You can plug in different types of cards, one of which we passed around last week, which was a video card, so that you can give your computer the ability to have a monitor connected. But one of the things I think we said last week is that increasingly do computers come with a lot of built-in functionality, such that these days a typical user might need to buy maybe a video card, if anything, if that person is building his or her own computer. If you just buy something from Dell or Apple, you get everything that you actually need. But you might also install something like a, a TV card, maybe. If you really wanted to watch TV in your computer, well, you often need special hardware to do that. And it might be a card like this, then in addition to having the ability to plug into the inside of the computer. On the outside might be like a coax jack for your cable signal or for your antenna or whatever. So what about these three slots, by contrast? Yeah, so that's where your memory goes. And I think we've probably spent enough time on that for now. But let's actually consider, just so that, let's go back to these slots for just one moment. They're each labeled with um, these white values. So what are the taller? Uh, black slots on the left here are apparently labeled as, if you can see it. Yeah, so ISA 1 and 2, I think, whereas the white slots to the right are labeled PCI. So these are just different types of expansion card technology. It's not so important right now to dwell on the technical specifics, but suffice it to say that ISA is older and slower, and in fact, is not even found on most modern motherboards. So this has no such ISA slots. PCI is newer and faster. Even newer than that is PCIe or PCI Express, which for our purposes is yet better, yet newer and faster. And there's also another related type of slot, which this motherboard does have, called AGP. And essentially these days, you would often use one of these types of slots for your video card. And I say this if only because it may come up in, for instance, the games workshop if you talk about hardware that's requisite for some games today. If you yourselves want to build a really fancy gaming computer, one of the relatively few things a gamer would pay particularly close attention to is these things, insofar as a really good video card could actually run you several hundred dollars, which is more than some minimalist computers themselves these days. Yeah. Ah, good question. Is the, are the PCI slots where you might put a wireless card? Yes. If you wanted to put a, um, if you wanted to make your desktop computer wireless, you could buy a so-called wireless card. It would look similar in spirit to this thing, but it would give you the capability of wireless access. And yeah, most likely these days it would go in a PCI slot. And in this particular motherboard, which I think was from a Pentium uh, 2, maybe 3, the AGP slot here, um, looks similar in color to the ISA slots, but it is where this computer's video card would have gone. But for now, let's dwell finally on these things, which we can't really see. All right, how many of you did take up that challenge of going home and pulling out someone else's computer cables? Anyone? No. It's always, yes? Okay, excellent. And how's the computer this week? Oh, they are. See, that's the thing. Color coding and proper shapes make this a fairly easy task. In fact, let's try to paint by numbers or shapes here. What is this representative of on the back of your computer? That's good. So we even had a whole video on that last week. So yeah, that's just the power connector. Here you have an excerpt from that very motherboard from a different angle. The things on the top, uh, on the far left, two circles, where do you plug into those? Yeah, keyboard and mouse usually, though decreasingly so these days. Those circles, circles are examples of PS2 connectors, PS2 ports. This just refers to a relatively older technology now via which you connect your, print, your keyboard or your mouse. Contrast this with the newer type of slot that you also connect keyboards and mice to now, which are which in the picture? <laughs> 
Yeah, the so-called USB ports, which are the ones immediately to the right of these circles. So this computer has two USB slots, as you might call them, or USB ports. USB, as is often going to be the case in our discussions, newer and faster, and it's not restricted to keyboards and mice. In fact, for a while, lots of new computers, Pentium 3s in particular, were shipping with USB ports, but they were still shipping with PS2, mice, and keyboard ports. And most PCs do still come with these as well, though you don't have to use them. And it was sort of a silly scenario, since relatively few devices existed beyond keyboards and mice that could plug into USB. And it was a really stupid advancement in that light, in that you don't need a faster technology for human keystrokes and human mouse movements, right? A computer is doing billions of things at a time. Your hand's not moving that fast. You don't need a particularly fast technology. But these days, many devices use USB. It stands for Universal Serial Bus, which just implies, in effect, you can put anything on this thing. And you can have multiple devices. In fact, even though this computer only has two USB ports, you can get what's called a USB hub, which is just a little cheap plastic device with some circuitry inside that lets you connect into one of those slots, and then it gives you four new ones, or maybe eight new ones. What kinds of devices connect to USB these days? OK, so MP3 players, like iPods and so forth. Cameras, digital cameras. Printers, uh, memory sticks, memory sticks would be memory card readers, I would say, because the sticks go into the readers. But yeah, so I'll put that into the cameras, uh, readers, okay, PDAs. My handwriting's just didn't, okay, here we go, all right. PDAs, hard drives, cell phones, zip drives, okay, so I think we're getting the point. So. Most anything you can think of can plug into the USB port these days. A lot of new hardware. I would say the most common ones these days would certainly be iPods and the equivalents, um, printers, digital cameras, and these days also external hard drives. So even though we talked about hard drives as being these internal ugly things that you plug inside of a computer and in section and in the online videos of the week, you'll see a bit more of this in detail, you can actually buy external hard drives these days which are wonderful for backups. And uh, we won't spend any time on this right now, but if there's one thing I can preach only from personal experience is that backups, as you yourselves may have realized, are a good thing. And even though I actually don't think there's very good user-friendly backup software on the market to this day, at least software that I find sufficiently mindless that it's worth doing, at least buying a $50, $100 external USB drive that you just connect with a cable that fits into a slot like that and just lets you drag files from your computer to like your D drive, which it would be called, or to another icon on your desktop, at least do something like that. And a lot of people do this to store their music and so forth so as to connect it to multiple computers if they wish. But um, let's finish this up. What's about, let's go bottom right, these little holes, easy one. Good. Speakers, microphone, and also audio in, and whatever that means for your purposes. These two are, tend to be color-coded, but often a good trick is just to plug your speakers into each of them and see which is the right one. Though they are typically labeled, but they all look the same. Uh, what about this long trapezoidal one here? Good. This is the parallel port. It's not found on Macs. It is still found on a lot of PCs. It is where you used to connect your printer and your scanner, usually. It is largely deprecated these days. Only older printers tend to use this. These days, most new printers will use USB, certainly for consumers. Um, there's a couple other ports, similarly having fallen into disuse. These guys here are actually... This is probably supposed to represent the VGA port. I'm no, Or a serial port. It's unclear. Uh, we'll say serial. So these two are examples of serial ports or gaming ports where you might connect a joystick or a modem in yesteryear. They too have largely fallen into disuse. USB is a nice thing in that it really has, it is universal in the sense that it's supplanted a lot of these older, slower pieces of hardware. And eventually I'm sure a lot of that stuff will go away. There's another type of port that's not on this board. Those of you who might have a digital camera or an external hard drive use another type of port. Okay. S-Video, DVI, and FireWire. I'll take FireWire for the moment. So FireWire is essentially 
It's again similar in spirit to something like USB in that its purpose is just to allow you to transmit data from A and B. It's not necessarily as flexible as USB, but FireWire is typically used these days for really high performance devices, stuff where you really want data quickly. For those of you who have nice digital cameras with hundreds of photos you might have taken, the faster you can get those off the camera and onto your computer, the better. So typically getting a camera that supports FireWire is a good thing because it in turn tends to be faster than any of the types of buses we've discussed up here thus far. And it comes in two different flavors. USB, uh, rather FireWire 400, 800. Uh, start thinking like an engineer, which one's better? That is your question. The 800 one tends to be faster. And for the specifics on these actually, this is a good way to introduce one of the other resources on the course's website. We try not to inundate you with information in lectures as there already is 30 pages worth apparently. But you do have your sheets of jargon which will often elaborate on some of the numbers and the specifics that are easy to get caught up in but aren't that fundamentally interesting. But a wonderful website that we make use of on the course's website is on the left here where we say computer dictionary. And if you were for instance to type in something like Firewire and then say look up, the Webopedia dictionary here is a wonderful dictionary for computer related terms and honestly if you find that a term is not on our jargon sheet or you want yet more technical detail I would certainly say start here and it's a wonderful resource at that. Um, also another useful website even though it's maintained by effectively random people on the internet is Wikipedia if you're familiar. We'll come back to this perhaps next week but if you do a Google search for Firewire and Wikipedia you'll often get even more detailed and often even better vetted information because so many more eyes have been on it. And if you want to read up on your heart, to your heart's content on Firewire, there's often even more information there. Wikipedia, though again, we'll come back to it perhaps next week, is a wonderful resource for computer information. If only because those folks who know the answers to questions like what is Firewire tend to be there, say those people who are in front of their computers all the time and therefore have time to post to sites like Wikipedia. So that's at least my take on the situation. But Perhaps we'll get some nice emails from random people from the podcast now. Anyhow, any questions on these types of ports, as they might generally be called, or buses? Just means of connecting in, uh, devices to your computer. Yeah. <coughs> ah, a good question. How much faster is a regular USB, USB 1 versus USB 2? Let's actually use this as a useful exercise here. So if I actually use Wikipedia, USB. Search here, so universal serial bus is what it stands for, and if we actually get the values, I always honestly forget the specifics myself, unless one of the teaching fellows knows offhand. Here we go. So a, I guess this, yeah, so USB 1 off, no, that's before. So USB 1, and I'm reminding myself partly off the cuff here, um, is about 1.5 to 12 megabits. High speed, aka USB 2, though there's even distinctions between those two, is about 480, what are we at, megabits per second. Much, much, much faster. Though buyer beware, it is the case, as I understand it, that just because you buy a device that's quote unquote USB 2.0 compliant, you also want the box to say high speed USB 2.0, because to my knowledge, there's a technical distinction between high speed USB 2 and just USB 2 but I'll defer to sources more authoritative. Though not that Wikipedia is necessarily authoritative, but it is good. All right, so let's, uh, oh, and this was, uh, uh, I was almost remiss. These two here, we'll come back to this in a couple of weeks time in our internet lectures, but the example on the right is an, ex your right is an example of what? And it's just a phone jack, and the example on the left? Yeah, so the one on the right is called an RJ11 jack. The one on the left is called an RJ45 jack. And one of the activities we'll actually do in section um, around the time of our internet lectures is have you crimp, that is make, your own ethernet cable. And so you will have the challenge, the pleasure, the frustration there, say, of actually making an ethernet cable with two of those types of connectors on either end. And your moment of triumph or Failure, perhaps, will come when we try plugging your homemade cable into a computer and into the wall and see if you can actually get our computer on the internet. So that'll be coming up in a couple of weeks' time.
IO devices, only because this is such an omnipresent acronym, uh, we would be remiss in not even mentioning it. IO in the world of computers just stands for input output, right? And this is sort of a mindless exercise that years ago used to be more interesting. But at this point in the lecture, we might fill the left column with input devices, the right column with output devices. Suffice it to say that a device like a keyboard or mouse is an example of an input device, since you, the human, are providing input. By contrast, an output device is something like a printer or a monitor that provides, the computer provides the output to you, the human. And you can think of any number of other examples as well these days. All right, so the money question, how to shop for a computer. So let me pause here, actually, and see if we can let you guide this discussion to some extent, since really this is meant to be the culmination of a lot of the background material we've offered, but now um, uh, parlay it into a real-world context, since at least at some point in the next year, two, three years, you each will probably have some choice over or make a purchase of a computer yourself. Anything on your mind? Here's your chance. Free advice. Though I suppose we have that website now, free answers to your questions about the computers and the internet. So, so much for that. Oh. Has Microsoft Vista been released yet? No, not in its final form. That is the next version of Windows. Uh, it's much touted in the media of late, the successor to Windows XP. Sort of a disaster since it's been so many years since uh, XP was released and not releasing new versions of software is not the best way to generate revenues. Um, it's also unclear to outsiders exactly what the value add in terms of functionality will be of the new OS. I would dare say that some of it um, is perhaps in greater stability, though anytime you overhaul an operating system, you're going to introduce other bugs and other security holes. A lot of it, I suspect, will boil down to user interface, flashier colors, translucent screens, and so forth. And I'm sure there will be some very real-world technical gains to it. But um, when it is released, I think is somewhat still up in the air since the, the release date keeps slipping. Are you not going to be the first to adopt No. I am quite content with Windows XP after four or five years of updates that have made it a fairly stable operating system now. Yes? You know what? <laughs> Discuss. Okay, so um, Mac OS, is it more stable, is it more secure than Windows? Numerically, Mac OS probably remains more secure to this day in the sense that relatively many fewer exploits, that is viruses and worms and spyware has been discovered or have taken advantage of that. Part of that is perhaps a function of how well designed the operating system is. Um, part of that is perhaps a function of how popular the operating system is. And it was actually interesting recently when John Hodgman, if you're familiar with the comedian who does those PC versus Mac commercials that are in vogue right now, he plays the PC guy. For the very first time, to my knowledge, Apple started advertising themselves as more secure. And they did not do this for long, even though people in the public would certainly point to Mac OS as being more secure. This is sort of a religious debate that even we have over in the CS department. And Frankly, I am never convinced by any of those on the side of Unix and Linux and Mac OS that Mac OS and the like are better fundamentally than Windows. We are talking about huge pieces of software these days. And even though, to some extent, Windows might not have been as well designed, it's also not as clear because it's not open source. So I will sort of stand by the sidelines and say that I actually find um, the debate in real term to be useful because, yes, if you buy a Mac, you are probably more, li more likely to be safe against various threats and exploits that a lot of PC users suffer. I am not comfortable saying that that's because the operating system is necessarily better just yet, though I'm sure you can find many hundreds of people to argue that perspective. It boils down to this. I, frankly, to this day, use a PC and Windows, not necessarily because I love it, but because it's convenient to use what most everyone else uses. And I actually find it to be faster for a lot of my purposes than Mac OS. I also have never been infected with a virus or worm in many years. So it is clearly possible running Windows to practice safe computing and not get yourself infected, to be honest. Um, typical users, this is harder, certainly, and perhaps being a student of computer science, you have a bit of an advantage of avoiding the bad stuff. Um, but I would say for a typical person or for someone who's buying a computer for their parent, 
it is perhaps better just to go with something like Mac OS because there's just fewer attacks on it. With that said, and the last comment on Mac OS versus Windows, for many years, I think Mac OS was touted as simpler and as easier to use. I would actually argue, since I just got my first Mac, I grew up on Macs and ditched them in 1997 and just this year got a Mac Mini again. I will claim, I do claim, and I think that Mac OS is just as complicated and as poorly laid out as Windows is to these days. So frankly, I like neither. I don't know where that leaves me, though. I won't even say that Linux or Unix is even better. I don't think, I think most of them have not been designed with proper user interface involved. Whew, good question. I don't even remember what the question was now. <laughs> Just got on my soapbox there. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a really good point in that Mac OS, for instance, supports software, and I've not used it myself, but called Parallels. And Dan can perhaps correct me on anything I say technically wrong here since he's our Mac guru. Um, Parallels essentially is, a, is virtual machine software. Just as virtual memory creates the illusion of more RAM, even though you're actually using hard disk space, a virtual machine is software that makes it look like you have another type of computer altogether. So on Mac OS, what you can essentially do is load up a window like you would any other program, but inside this window will be Microsoft Windows running inside of it and with it any programs that you might like to run. Conversely, if you have a PC, you actually, you've not been able to run Mac OS in a small window. However, you've been able to run on Windows other versions of Windows in what's called a virtual machine. Frankly, I think this is not a permanent solution, being able to use one computer and then emulate effectively the other in a small window. I think the holy grail, if these two OSs ultimately coincide, which is more likely now that they're both on the same Intel CPU, um, is that you'd be able to just double click one and run it on the other. But if that is compelling enough these days and it lowers the bar to saying, you know what, I'm gonna get a Mac because I can still use PC software, then go for it. There's always a performance hit. Running virtual machines is not as good as running real machines. The best solution here is to buy a Mac and buy a PC, and then maybe connect them to the same monitor and toggle between them. I don't have numbers offhand as to what the hit would be, but it would be slower. Yeah? But when boot camp came to making the, um, boot camp, the, uh, the Mac Yes, so that is different. And again, Dan, pay close attention to things I might say wrong. So boot camp is, allows you to dual boot a computer, which you've always been able to do, for instance, on PCs if you want to run maybe Windows XP or Linux and effectively be given the choice as to which one you want to run when your computer first starts up. Because Macs now have the same types of CPUs as PCs, they too can now do this such that when you turn on the Mac, you're prompted, do you want to boot Windows or do you want to boot Mac OS? That is better in that you're taking advantage of the hardware natively and you get better performance. The downside, though, is that if you want to change to the other OS, you have to reboot. And you don't have to do that with a virtual machine like Parallels. So it's a trade-off. And frankly, I used to do this, or I used to have three different operating systems on one computer, one hard drive, and I would just choose from a menu. The fact of the matter was, for me at least, it was always way more effort than it was worth to shut down, reboot, just to use the other computer. Though, <laughs> granted, um, because I can play the computer scientist card, I, just have, I solved that problem with just multiple computers. <laughs> So I, I'm not sure what's best for people not like me. Other questions before we pull up Dell's website? Then we pull up Dell's website. So here's the funny thing about companies like Dell and even Apple these days. I think that it is no wonder that this world is overwhelming to the less savvy of computer users and to neophytes and so forth. Because if you, for instance, want to buy a Dell desktop, let's say for home and home office, like, where do you even begin? Like, frankly, even I find an interface like this somewhat overwhelming, especially insofar as if we now to bore down, let's say, to the entry-level PCs. So now I, the user, have to choose between these kinds of things. And even though, at least in this category, there's only three, the page is pretty long. And that's why we hope that a course like E1 and the kinds of topics we cover is actually, hopefully, after this lecture and last, more of these columns' data would make a bit more sense. So in fact, let's take a look at the leftmost one, which is only $449, which is not bad for a fully functional computer, which apparently includes this as a CPU. So it's the Intel Celeron processor, which is just sort of a, 
uh, cheaper Pentium 4 these days, but most users would not notice the performance difference. It's more of a marketing thing. How fast is it, if you can see the small print? Yeah, so 2.53 gigahertz, that's plenty fast. Again, for a typical user, quibbling over 2.5 or 2.6, 2.7, you're not really going to feel. Um, one of, well, it's going to come with Windows XP. What about this? How much RAM does it have? <coughs> Excuse me, 512 megabytes. So that's not bad, but there is where Dell starts, Dell and companies like them start to try to work you on the upsell. 512 is not bad, 1024. 2048 is better, and I'm sure if we add this to our shopping cart and start tweaking these values, we very quickly move away from the 449, but again, not a bad machine. Certainly, if you're only checking email, browsing the web, writing essays, this is more than enough, because frankly, you could have done all of that six years ago for three times the price, but with much slower hardware, admittedly. Um, what about the hard drive? How big's the hard drive? Yeah, so 160 gigabytes. That might sound big. I mean, how many of you have a hard drive that is that big or bigger? So relatively few. So that is to say, assuming most of you have computers, it sounds like most of your hard drives are smaller than 160. And I would go so far as to say that these days for desktops, 160 is quite small, actually. Again, buy for 80 bucks a 400 gigabyte hard drive. That's not so much money these days when you're talking for that much amount of storage. Here's a question then, what, for a desktop, for a desktop. Laptop hard drives tend to be more expensive per gigabyte. So when I've quoted these prices, it's usually for desktops. And usually for laptops, you won't get as large hard drives for reasons of speed, cost, performance, heat, and so forth. Um, well, here's a question. Clearly, we have a room full of people who are perfectly content, dare say, with their sub 160 gigabyte hard drives. Why are there all these people in the world that need 400 gigabyte hard drives? Yeah. Okay, true. So it goes without saying that they need it for storage. But why? Where in lie the increasing demands? New software. New software. No longer is so Microsoft Word 5.1a on Macintosh oh, uh, 7.0 came on four floppy disks, as I recall. This was you know 10, 15 years ago. Four floppy disks. How big is a floppy disk? 1.44 megabytes, okay? Microsoft Office these days comes on CDs, maybe even a DVD now. So certainly increasing software needs uh, drive this to some extent. What's even more demanding than software, perhaps? Perfect. So things like photos, videos these days, um, iPods and cameras driving that, or uh, music. Certainly, all of these things just start, start to take up space. But let's just put it into perspective, but we'll come back to this in our multimedia lecture. How big is a typical MP3? An MP3 is just a very popular format for sound files, popularized perhaps by Napster and those kinds of programs years ago. An MP3 constitutes one song, usually, three minutes, six minutes. How big is a typical MP3? So three megabytes, maybe six megabytes. So usually in that range, I would say two to six megabytes. It depends on how you encode it. But think of that. These days, years ago, you could fit a whole program like Microsoft Word on four floppies. These days, you can't even fit one song on one floppy. And that just gives you a taste of the sort of increasing storage needs that arise, and especially when, um, what about backups? If you want to maintain backups, you effectively need, what, twice as much space. And that, too, is sort of a driving need, perhaps, for some of these needs. So a whole slew of reasons. And so it is not unreasonable for these numbers to be increasing steadily as they are. Um, what about this? What kind of uh, optical media does this have? I know this, the print is small, unfortunately. Yeah, so a CD, DVD burner. And is it the plus or the minus flavor? Yeah, so this is the nice thing. So even though there are all different types of media, particularly for DVDs, fortunately, the industry has solved the hardware problem by making devices that do everything. Play CD minus R's, play DVD minus R's, plus R's, RW's, minus RW's. How much would, a, would such a drive cost? If you wanted to buy a CD, DVD, RW, R drive today, and pop it in your computer so that you can burn CDs and DVDs, what would you pay? Okay, I heard, well, how much? 100? 200. 200. Do I hear 300? <laughs> how about 20 bucks? <laughs> 
20 bucks, maybe 30 bucks. In fact, just to put some of these numbers into perspective, one of the machines that I bought in pieces recently, in a good way, piece by piece for research purposes, was from a website called Newegg. So actually, if you want random, off the cuff, completely subjective advice, a wonderful website for buying computer hardware, if you're buying it piecemeal, not whole systems, would be Newegg. You have very good, very competitive prices, and their shipping time is remarkable. This is sort of one of the places that your geekiest of friends probably do their computer shopping from. With that said, this is a, the purchase order from the machine we built for my research group. And again, the print's a little small here, and this, mind you, was a computer that we built from scratch. We did not go to Dell, we didn't go to Apple and say, give us model foo. We instead bought every individual piece, and this is actually something that you'll discuss in perhaps the workshop on building a PC in the course. So just to pull a few excerpts out, how about, uh, well this, how much does a floppy drive cost these days? Apparently six bucks, five ninety nine. Let's fast forward to my NEC drive. This is, how much was this? Careful, what's the left column mean? Quantity two, so it was about 35 bucks at the time. More recently, they have dropped to about 20 bucks. And again, here's some off the cuff, unsolicited, uh, completely subjective advice. NEC makes wonderful, in my experience and my guru friends' experience. And frankly, I might offer a lot of advice, but frankly, I'm just stealing it from my smarter friends who I've asked these same questions of um, for recommendations. So take them for what they are. Um, but yeah, about 20 bucks for the same thing. In fact, let's see. It's always dangerous doing a demo in class. Okay, 29.99 currently. Not so bad. How about the CPU that is in this research machine? So yeah, so it's damn expensive. $632. And you want to see something really tragic. I built this computer, I think, in August. <laughs> it breaks my heart. Yes, that's what my face looked like at the time, too. So anyhow, $632 at the time, two, three months later, $280. This is the way things work. This is also a function of this having been almost a top of the line CPU, which this is one of these do as I say, not as I do. It is usually not necessary or wise or financially appropriate for a typical user. And by that I mean someone with very normal needs, web browsing, essays, that sort of stuff, not research type work. You're always overpaying for the highest end model of computer equipment. You'll pay $100 more, $200 more, and you probably won't, as a human, even appreciate the gain. So what we did in this case was buy the CPU that was, I think, just one tick shy of the top of the line. Had we gone two ticks down, which for a typical user would not have made a difference in terms of performance. For some of the research stuff we do, it would. But we would have saved $300 two months ago had we gone with a more reasonable consumer line CPU. But how fast is this thing? 2.4 gigahertz, but it's almost like getting a twofer because it's also dual core. And that's effectively like having two CPUs in one. Yeah? Uh, is dual core having, is similar to having a dual motherboard? No, it's almost exactly like having two CPUs on one motherboard. The dual cores share everything else. And they sit in the form factor of that little square, essentially, that we passed around last week. So that was a teaser of Dell's site, and again, the lesson here is perhaps, hopefully, even though there's a lot of content on these, even in Best Buy, Sunday Catalog, you'll see numbers like this, and even more, L1 cache, L2 cache, and so forth, having a sense for the ranges that are appropriate, and seeing them laid out in sort of good, better, best format should give you somewhat of a sense of the trade-offs, certainly cost-wise. How about Apple.com, just so that we're fair to both sides of the most popular OSs? So here we have... Max line. Let's go to the uh, let's go to the Mac Mini, just because there's these two models now, both of which are Core Duo. This is stupid marketing. Rather than say dual core, which frankly makes grammatical sense and flows fairly easily off the tongue, um, Intel has called it the Core Duo CPU, which just means it has duo or two cores. Whatever. So you have two different models here, essentially um, good and better, to put it into sort of classic Apple speak. Um, give me a couple of the specs on the cheaper machine at left. Rattle off a couple of numbers. If you... All right, so that's the speed of the CPU, 1.66 gigahertz. What's the L2 cache? 
2 megabytes. So sometimes you do have discretion over how big the L2 cache is, or at least when you're given two different options, you might have a model that has one meg of L2 cache and another with two. L2 cache tends to be a good thing, and buying the computer with more of it can, depending on your needs, offer some gains. And that's a number worth paying attention to. L1 cache, if it's even listed, really doesn't matter to anyone buying a computer to the extent that it's more a function of the CPU you're getting rather than some line item that's separate. Uh, what about, um, what's this combo drive? What does that mean? Yep, combo drive is just a nice user-friendly way of saying it does everything. CDs, DVDs. This time they don't say plus R's, but it might if we looked very closely. I'd be surprised if they were not uh, sort of functional with it. Oh, actually it's not. So this one, that's what you get for 200 bucks, is the, the ability to read your friend's poorly selected plus R's, for instance. Yeah? Um, so 1.66 gigahertz for Duo processor, is that half, is that two processors that are half 1.66 or two 1.66? Uh, good question. They both, as I understand the marketing, both of them operate at 1.66 gigahertz, both cores. So here's a question, very real world question. We've got two computers laid out against each other. One's 1.66 gigahertz, one's 1.83 gigahertz. They are identical except for the hard drives. How big is one? Versus 60 versus 80, all right. And what else is different? Well, the combo drive is a little fancier. It's dual layer, which means you can store yet more data. It's sort of trendier. So the sort of $200 question is, which one do you get? Well, what thoughts might go through your mind? What, like what? What don't you need? Uh, physically, they're probably identical in size. So it's what's that? Right, that's probably the most important question. What are you going to do with this computer? And honestly, this is a hard decision because at least, you know, not to say money is no object, but when you're only talking $200 and you feel like, well, I could get the good one or I can get the best one, it's sort of an emotional decision, perhaps more than a technical one to make. So what are you going to use it for? I would actually say if your needs are to plop a computer on your desk and use it for email, web browsing, word processing, save yourself the $200 and go with the one at the left. The only thing that might be compelling to go with the faster one isn't so much for the CPU speed. Maybe it's for the DVD, but that's only if you have a very clear vision as to why you would want the fancier optical drive. What if you have a program, what if you like to use programs like Photoshop or image programs that do tend to be very CPU intensive? Then I would say that you're not so much the typical user anymore, at least as I would describe it, and are more of a specialized one, and you might gain from the additional couple hundred megahertz. Um, in that case, especially if it's for business, I would err on the side of too good than the cheaper one, but that would be more of a specialized need, I would say. Yeah? Absolutely. There's a, this pressure to buy more, especially since they go out of date. And at least the fancier one you get, that buys you a couple extra months of modern um, modernity or just being current and fast. And it's hard, right? It's no accident that there's no clear decision, right? We're not talking about the one that's awful versus the one that's good. We're talking about a very small marginal difference. And one metric that I would say might be relevant to a typical user would be the hard disk space. But again, do you really want to pay $200 for an additional 20 megabytes? When by contrast, if you're, this is a desktop computer by design, if you're going to put it on your desktop, for 80 bucks, you could buy a 400 gigabyte drive, buy a $20 enclosure, as it's called, which is just a metal or plastic box with a power supply to it, connect it via USB or Firewire, and bam, you just now spent $100 instead of $200, and you got 400 gigabytes rather than 20 more gigabytes. So at least having exposure to the different trade-offs hopefully can be of help. So the history of computers, and this is a whirlwind tour, um, is sort of beyond the scope of what we aspire to do since we try to teach you more of what's current so that when you exit the course, your knowledge is at least good for a couple of months, though uh, technically last week's information is already out of date. Um, 
Just a few screenshots that I'll defer to the footnotes for your own edification if you're interested. This is one of the first computers. This, I believe, is the Mark I, which should still be on display in the Harvard Science Center, actually in this building down the hall. So actually, if you want a neat sort of, uh, uh, wow, we're relevant lecture, walk down the hallway and you'll see this computer, which was built in 1943 or thereabouts. What you'll see here, and we'll come back to this issue in our programming lecture, is an example of the first bug. So a bug generally refers to a mistake in a program, something that's erroneous going on. Well, back in the day, the 40s, the first bug, the first problem with, I think, the vacuum tubes in the computer or whatnot was, in fact, a bug, which is here on um, the woman's lab notes um, with the bug taped to it. But what we'll focus on next week is what began really in the 1970s. And this is the device, the Altair 8800 that you'll see in the film, Pirates of Silicon Valley, that got Bill Gates and Paul Allen so ter terribly excited, if only because initially there was no way or no easy way to program this box. This, in effect, was a very simple computer, but there was no obvious way of how to make it do things, even though it was capable of doing things. Well, this here, Paul Allen and Bill Gates from the 70s or thereabouts, um, this is perhaps their rivals, at least for marketing, um, from a marketing perspective, but you also see more personal interconnections in the film, Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, at least the latter of whom you're probably very familiar with, started Apple, got fired from Apple, returned to Apple, and is, in a sense, rejuvenated it with the iPods, the so-called halo effect, and so forth. They will be prominently featured in the film. You'll see not only at the advent of the Macintosh, but also the earliest computer, the Apple II, um, the first most popular desktop program that actually propelled the Apple platform to popularity was something called VisiCalc. Essentially, the very first version of a spreadsheet program was one of the programs that really helped marshal in the personal computer era, certainly in the world of business. And simply moving from paper, pencil, ledgers to something electronic was a huge and compelling gain. Fast forward to the 80s, when even you might have had these green screen computers, might have played old fashioned games this way. You didn't use floppy disks in the current sense, you used five and a quarter, literally, floppy disks that held a few kilobytes, a few hundred kilobytes of information. And in 1984 was the Macintosh's release. During the Super Bowl of 1984, Apple aired a commercial that only aired once at the time, and it was to usher in the introduction of the Macintosh. This, too, will be featured in next week's film. Um, this is a somewhat doctored version. You'll notice that even though this film was from 1984, somehow or other the woman featured in it has an iPod on her belt. It was re-released years later, but it only aired once during the Super Bowl, and we'll leave you with this teaser for next week. No accident, the film is overtoned in blue. At the time, the enemy, at least from uh, Steve Jobs' vision, was supposedly IBM, a.k.a. Big Blue. But as the movie depicts, Microsoft was perhaps a greater threat. So with that cliffhanger, we'll see you next week.